Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Uh, I'd like to welcome everyone to uh, this is thinking out of the lunchbox. It's a little different. If you haven't been here before, this may seem normal to you before. If you have been here before, um, this is thinking out of the lunchbox. David Wood is still the master of ceremonies. Um, <laughs> lunch is still at 11:30, and uh, the lecture <laughs> and the lecture is still at noon. Um, the big change is that we're in a different spot now. So uh, I hope you like this. This place, the, the chairs, I think, are more comfortable, and, and uh, it's, a, it's a good venue, I think, for a, a talk. Um, before we get started, let me just pitch a couple of library programs. Uh, we, we've got a, a, a calendar of events that are going on that are on the table right outside the door here. Um, there are a couple of events that did not make it on this calendar that I would like to bring to your attention. Uh, the first one is on uh, February 26th. That's a Sunday at 3 o'clock in the afternoon. The Nashville Philharmonic Orchestra will be giving a, a free public concert uh, here in this auditorium. Um, that'll be a last about an hour, and there will be a reception to follow so that there will be food uh, afterwards. Uh, the, the, it's a good program, and on, included on the program if, is Handel's Royal Fireworks, so I hope you can come and, and join us for that. And then um, on Saturday, April the 7th, from 10 o'clock to 4 o'clock, we're having the Nashville Scottish Heritage Festival. This is the, the second year that we've tried that. Last year we did this the first time and over 1,000 people showed up, so it, it, was, a, it was a big hit. It, it's going to be here. Uh, part, part of it will be in here and, and on the conference area. Uh, there will be bagpipes and dancing, storytelling, and tartans, and children's activities. We won't be doing, I don't know what that's called. Have you ever seen them? It looks like they're throwing telephone poles. We won't be doing that, but there'll be plenty of other activities. I hope you can come and join us. Um, so today we kick off a new version of our Out of the Lunchbox series. Uh, it's a, I think it's a better lecture hall and certainly more comfortable chairs. So just sit back and enjoy, and I'll let David Wood introduce our speak today's speaker. Thank you. Well, I, I want to thank the, the library staff, uh, all of them, for the wonderful um, adaptability and uh, welcome that they've given to the uh, need to make new arrangements, and uh, uh, especially um, Trisha Bengal, our interim director, I guess, of the library, and uh, Jenna Schmidt, and uh, the uh, staff of the uh, Audiovisual behind the behind the glass back there, and and to thank you too for uh, coming back for our second series. Um, as you know, uh, things have, um, are a bit tight these days, and uh, Vanderbilt's allocating its its funding in a different direction, and so we are find, trying to find uh, other ways of um, uh, sponsoring the, the the new series, and. Uh, <coughs> One of the options would be just to do away with the lunch. Another option would be to um, try and get sort of online booking and paying for lunches ahead of time. And the third option is to get some outside sponsorship. And I'm going to be talking to the friends of the library because I think they might be a good source uh, for that. Uh, but I'm 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 thrilled um, that that we could all be back here. And I think in some ways these arrangements may even be better, so that. Um, change uh, can be a good thing rather than just something we have to tolerate and put up with. Well, I'm thrilled to um, present to you my friend and colleague John Locks today. When John last gave one of these talks, uh, a number of you came up to me afterwards and said, now that's how it should be done. Uh, you got to bring him back. And I said, I'm sorry, we don't, we don't bring people. Uh, there's too much other talent out there. That was the first series. But with the launch of this second series, I thought we should kick the whole thing off with the star of the last series, and I did ask him back. Well, I've known John since before I came to Vanderbilt. He was part of the interviewing committee that grilled me after my job talk. 
Um, and I'll never forget him ans asking me a question which so went something like, like, for all your fancy footwork, David, um, what about the fish downstream? What was the practical implication of, of, of what I was saying? And this was not a casual question. Uh, John's committed to philosophy playing an active role in public life. He's been chair of the American Philosophical Association's Centennial Committee, charged with promoting the private value and social usefulness of philosophy, which involves activities throughout the country, radio programs, book signings, coffee house conversations, all designed to show the relevance of philosophy to life. And I've no doubt that talks like this would come at the top of such a list. And John is a master of the medium. He's a winner of many teaching awards, he's a natural communicator, and he's the most sought after teacher and mentor in our department. It all began with a PhD from Yale, way back when, when he was one of the founding members of our current philosophy department. He's written many books, including uh, On Santayana, A Community of Individuals, The Philosophy of William Ernest Hocking, Thinking in the Ruins, In Love with Life, The Relevance of Philosophy for Life. Uh, some of these are out on the, uh, the book stand, uh, just out there. And his uh, book, Stoic Pragmatism, is um, in press, coming out shortly, I believe. And in intriguingly, this is described by one of his reviewers as a direct attack on fundamentalisms of all sorts and on aggressive fanaticisms. Locke's recommendations for philosophy and for life are rooted in a deeply thought out individualism that's not individualistic. That's pretty smart thought. John is also general editor of the Encyclopedia of American Philosophy. Well, as you will have gathered, his philosophical interests center on human nature, which leads him into metaphysics, philosophy of mind, political philosophy, and ethics. He's got continuing research interests in American philosophy and in German idealism. And he also does a lot of teaching and research in medical ethics and business ethics. Well, I am delighted to introduce, reintroduce to you, my friend and colleague, John Locks, our very own Socrates, who will talk to us today about the cost of comfort. Thank you, thank you, David. Uh, the only resemblance to Socrates is that he too was bald. Uh, if you let me, I'll walk, because I, that way I, I want to make sure I don't fall asleep while I talk. Uh, I, uh, many, many faces. I hope you're having a good day. Many, many lovely faces that I know. It's good to see you here. Uh, I uh, am on a personal quest to understand what's going on in our lives. Uh, obviously, we all are. The quest in this case is... How come, how is it possible that we lead such a comfortable, such a wonderful life? And we do. How is it that nevertheless we are unhappy and frustrated? Uh, consider how many people are mentally ill. It's not because now we know, it's, uh, and, and, and before people wouldn't have been diagnosed, it's, it's that there's something in our culture that is problematic, that causes this, and I think we need to identify what it is. I, I want to spend a minute about the cost of our comfort, but m first, the comfort. Uh, consider how wonderful it is to drive down, not on horseback, not walking, but actually drive down. Of course, you can't find a parking place, that doesn't matter. <laughs> but uh, nevertheless, you, know, you, you, want, you want to go to New York, you, you hop on a plane, and uh, uh, there you are. Uh, Andrew Jackson uh, made it to, from Washington to back to Nashville. in somewhere in the neighborhood of a week and a day, uh, horseback. And it was a record. Uh, ooh, I like that. <laughs> I, I, I like that one. Where, where'd you get that? <laughs> uh, 
just just a, a couple of things. You know, uh, uh, in the Middle Ages, it, all the way all the way to George Washington, people's teeth gave them the most horrendous trouble. Washington himself uh, had uh, uh, teeth made because he didn't have any of his own uh, out of uh, black walnut. Can you imagine that? How that tastes, black walnut in your mouth. Uh, you know, you, you go to a dentist and the problem is solved. There's not an issue. Um, in, in, in Europe, most of the little communities that people lived in in the Middle Ages, most of those communities were populated by people who never went beyond two miles outside the community. Uh, and we go everywhere. And, and, and we don't even have to go anywhere because, alas, everything is in my computer at home. Anything that you want, lots of things that you don't want, information that you don't know what to do with, you're deluged by it. We live very comfortably. You know, when, 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 uh, when it gets hot, we turn on the air conditioner. When it gets cold, you, uh, uh, we, we turn on the heat. Uh, have you been to Ireland as I have been and seen something called Bunratty Castle. It's well named. It's ratty. It's uh, the 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 wind blows in between those huge blocks uh, that that constitute the wall. It's 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 unbelievable. People lived like that. Small wonder they had to be drunk most of the time. <laughs> we are not like that. So comfort for sure. So why is it that we're so unhappy? Why is it that we find ourselves frustrated? Uh, an, an instance of frustration. A few years ago, uh, someone walks into the county commissioner's office in San Francisco and pulls a gun and shoots him dead. Now, why would a person do a thing like this? Well, obviously, because he never, ha never had a hearing as an individual. He was not in a position to be taken seriously. He had some grievance. It may have been an insignificant grievance. That isn't the point. The point is that there ought to be, or so we feel, there ought to be somebody who listened to us as individuals, quirky as we are, and say, yeah, well, we can't do this, but we can do that for you. In other words, takes us seriously. So what is it that explains this? What is it that explains this? I've got a theory. You know, philosophers love theories. So I, my theory, do you mind if I strip? <laughs> I won't go all the way, but uh, 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 it just make myself comfortable so I can talk to you. Uh, think about it for a minute. Uh, the unity of human action, the unity of human action, that's what we're talking about. Here's what I mean by the unity of human action. Bald people, coming back to Socrates, Bald people sometimes like to have their heads scratched. I'm one such. Now, my wife is not here to do it, so I'm going to have to do it myself. Notice what happens. I form an intention, a plan. I'm going to scratch. I execute it. And I really enjoy the results. <laughs> That's what I would call the unity of a human action, where the same person plans, does, enjoys, or suffers. If I don't scratch it right, I suffer. But I'll scratch it right. I've learned how to do it. Now, what happens in our society is that there are huge institutions. Consider for a minute the institution of American Airlines, now bankrupt. Uh, American Airlines has tens of thousands of employees, some of them baggage handlers, some of them pilots, some of them stewardesses, uh, some of them do nothing but put oil in the, uh, gas in the planes, right? All of this, all of these people work together for a single act, which is the act of conveying me from here to Washington, right? Now, uh, what happens? Well, here's what, here's what takes place, and that's the sad part of it. What takes place is, yes, on the good side, comfort like you've never seen. On, on the other side, you find yourself in a, set, in, a, in a situation where no one actually knows what's being done. No one actually has an idea of how these things get accomplished. No one person had made any plans. 
No one person had executed this. No one person is enjoying the results or, or, or the pain of it. It's all tens of thousands of people, all of them in concert somehow operating. And the more we do this, the more we do this, and it's inevitable that we will, the more we do this, we, the more we find ourselves in a situation where we're frustrated because the individual doesn't seem to matter. Worse, uh, we're frustrated because we have a sense of tremendous passivity and impotence. Uh, if you go to a bank and you happen to have a, a, a safety deposit box that you want to access, every single time you go there, there's a different procedure because the expert the experts have been there, and they said, you're not doing it right. You do this, you do that, you do that. You, here's, here's how you do it. And as far as I'm concerned, that's how, you know, it doesn't matter to me how you do it so long as you do it, but they can't do it because the experts said thus and so. Uh, so, so what happens, what happens is that we get uh, so distant, so distant from our acts, from our own acts, we become so uh, frustrated and so, with some, so much of a sense of impotence that we can't turn anything around. We can't, we're not in a position to, to, to help ourselves or to help anybody else. I'll give you examples of what I have in mind. Here's one. I uh, bought a blanket. It was on sale. And I, I promised I would never say what company I bought it from. It was pennies. Uh, and I noticed that um, when I brought it home, it had a hole in the middle, almost exactly in the geographical middle, the hole. And I thought, I'd take it back, I took it back, and the lady who was working uh, said, you can't take this back, it was a final sale. Well, I thought, I thought I'd be cute and philosophical about this, and I said, look, of course it was a final sale. I understand that. But when I bought it, I got less than what I wanted and more than what I wanted. And she was puzzled. I said, I got less than what I wanted because it wasn't a complete blanket. And I got more than what I wanted because it was a blanket in a hole. <laughs> and I, 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 I would like to leave the hole with you and just take the blanket. <laughs> Well, this, you can imagine how this went over, like a lead balloon, as they say. <laughs> well, back and forth we went. And uh, uh, eventually she said, look, why are you picking on me? <laughs> she said, I only work here. And I said, oh my God, how stupid of me. I should have talked to somebody who doesn't work here. <laughs> So the end of the story is, I said, if, where is your supervisor? Out to lunch. Well, supervisors are always out to lunch, it looks like. <laughs> I said, well, in that case, I will write to the head of the company, who is that person? And she said, I had no, I have no idea. I said, well, where's the person located? She said, I don't know. Here's a person who is working, I said, like all of us, here's a person who is working for a company and doesn't want to take responsibility for anything that goes on, right? And she is absolutely blameless, so she thinks, because, look, there's a troublemaker is coming here. He should have been happy with the damn hole. <laughs> so she is giving me the sense that I don't matter. Right? I'm a customer. Customers matter. No, they don't. She gives me the sense that She's utterly ignorant of what's going on. There's no idea. I, I should have asked her, what company do you work for? Would she see, see if she'd know? She may not know that it was pennies. So everything becomes, in a world like this, everything becomes manipulation. So what, what, I, what I need to do then is find a way in which I can get her to be nice to me. Of course, the obvious way to do that is to be nice to her. So you say, well, thank you for helping me, even if you're not, but you don't say that part of it. Thank you for helping me. You're, you're a wonderful person, and so on. Not a word of that is true. I don't feel that way. But that's what we do in order to get results. So number one, 
manipulativeness. Number two, a distance. I call it a psychic distance. A psychic distance from our very actions. We don't know what we cause. And the reason we don't know what we cause is because we cause it. I don't cause it. We do it together. And if you do it together, then there are planners, there are doers, there are sufferers. And the planners and the doers and the sufferers are different people. And they don't sometimes communicate with each other. Lots of times, one, will, one of them will say, uh, you do it this way, and that person having to take the orders, uh, say, uh, you know, you don't understand, uh, it doesn't work that way, but never mind, do it that way. And so that person has got to do it, and then out comes uh, unpredictable and disastrous outcomes uh, that, that demean people, that, that, that are nasty to, to, to human beings, happen. Manipulativeness, psychic distance from our own actions. I'll give you a psychic distance example. Uh, it's an old example, but a very poignant one. Uh, met a guy who was a B-52 pilot uh, during the Vietnam War. Uh, he's a very old man now. Uh, he said, you know, I never understood what it meant, what it meant for me to do what I did. He said, we took off from Guam, several hours, we brewed some coffee, easy flying above the clouds, we would get near the target, uh, start the bombing run, still above the clouds, push some buttons, the bombs away, brew another cup of coffee, we're going home to Guam. That's it. He was shot down. He was shot down. And all of a sudden, he said he had firsthand experience of what it's like when the B-52s are flying above. And uh, he, would, he would even know these are the guys, and this is probably Joe, and this is, oh, he could hear that. He knew the, the hum of the motors. And uh, then the bombs would fall. And he, and he said, you, you can't imagine the difference between being on the receiving end and being on the hand that dishes it out. Um, he, he, was, he was in captivity for three years, and he said his eyes were opened, not against war, that wasn't the point, but the point was how shielded we are from what we do, how shielded we are. There's another example, uh, still concerning the, uh, the Second World War, a uh, Japanese general, Yamamoto, who uh, was in charge in uh, the Philippines, and he said to his troops, do what you need to do. Do what you need to do in order to stop the insurrection that was in the uh, little villages, the other side of the jungle. And they went in there, and what they did was, uh, Massacre everybody. They, they, they shot the people because that, do what you need to do, well, that did the job. So it's a little bit like uh, saying, I can, I can stop you from speeding, uh, all of you from speeding by uh, sending the uh, highway patrol out and uh, whoever speeds more than five miles over the speed limit is hauled out of the car and executed on the spot. You know, that stops it. Well, they stopped it. Uh, the interesting part of it is that when we apprehended General Yamamoto, he proved that he was not in charge of his people, of, of the soldiers. The communications were just not, non-existent. They broke down. Nevertheless, the, the court found him guilty because if, even though he didn't know what they were doing, he should have known. He should have been familiar with the ultimate outcome of these acts. And, uh, and eventually he got executed for that. So, so what, I'm, what I'm giving you these, these dramatic examples to understand is how very much we're in a position of uh, powerlessly looking on and not understanding what our own actions contribute to. And the frustration comes clearly from the fact that here we are, not in charge of what we do. We do what others tell us to do. 
And there are so many people involved that we're never, never in a position where we can say, hey, that was what I meant to do. Because if I mean to do something, I'm high in a, high in a hierarchy and I'm commanding others to do what I want done. And you know that it never gets done the way you want. It never gets done. Psychic distance, I only work here. Refusal to, res to, to take responsibility. Uh, a sense that we are totally exposed to people who don't have our goods, good, good fortune at, at heart. Now that's a glum picture. I wanna, I wanna say a few words about what we can do about it. Uh, if my theory is right, the number one issue is openness. Uh, we, have to, we have to find ways in which people understand the different elements of these huge social acts that we perform. These are huge social acts, like the act of ferrying people from here to Washington. These, these, we just need to have people know what the actions are to which they contribute. That's one. And here's the other one. Uh, much as this is inefficient, it's crucial for people to know what they're doing. It's crucial for people to be taken seriously so that they can have their input. In other words, not simply to follow their roles, not simply to follow the rules, not roles and not rules, but to make judgments about what is the humane thing to do. One of, the, one of the most difficult things to do is to deal with a bureaucrat who is totally convinced that the only thing to do is to play his role and follow the rules. Right? You, you've had that experience a million times, and I have it. I had it. Uh, we have to break through that. We have to get to the stage where uh, we don't hide behind our rules and roles. We have to get to the stage where we say, look, uh, the humane thing is more important than the formally correct thing. Um, at Vanderbilt, I and no longer serve on committees, university committees, th thank God. Uh, and, and the reason is because on every committee that I ever sat on, I always said, you know, I, I want to know more about what this person is asking for. Um, and they say, and they say, well, you know, we can't do what he's asking for. Can't do that. And the reason you can't do it is what? Well, because if we did that for him, we'd have to do it for everybody. And my answer to that is, then do it for everybody. But actually, it turns out you don't have to do it for any, anybody or everybody. You know, you have to do it for this person because this person is somebody special. Right? Individualism. David uh, mentioned that individualism has nothing, nothing to do with anything but this, that we are individuals. We're unescapably, inescapably individuals. There's nothing we can do about it. But it's absolutely crucial that that be respected by other individuals who don't become ciphers in a larger social organism. I think that's the message. It's very difficult to accomplish because it's easy to sink into your job so you can direct people one way or the other, but never tell them what it's all about. I, I think what we've got to do is to be with each other as persons. And if you're with others as persons, you will always consider them exceptions. Every individual is an exception. Does that make for a chaotic world? Not as chaotic as the misery that, uh, that we endure if you're not individuals. So I want to make sure that we have enough time to talk, but the long and the short of it is uh, this idea of breaking the human act, the natural human act, into its elements is precisely what we have got to counteract. And the way to counteract it is by total openness with each other and exposing every chain of act action to every element of the chain, every single person in there. Because if you don't do that, you'll always have resentful employees and frustrated human beings. Thank you very much.
Well, thank you so much, John. Uh, as you know, at this point, I uh, will address a few questions to um, our speaker, and then we'll open the discussion to the floor. Um, so I think the, the first question um, I would put to you is, is this. Um, I know you, you're, a, you're thought of as a libertarian. I don't know if that's... You, may, you are sometimes thought of as a libertarian. Uh, <laughs> Thoughts can be false. Um, but I, I don't know I, what it means to be a libertarian. I might be one for all I know. Okay. I don't know what it means. Um, well, I, I'm thinking about the, the analysis you're giving of the sort of breakdown of the bonds between people, the bonds between our actions uh, and the products that we're generating and, and so on. And, I, and I'm thinking, well, Marx gave an analysis of alienation that looks you know, pretty similar um, in, in some respects, and his solution to that was uh, imagining a, a different society not based on capital, not based on exploitation of workers and so on. And, of course, we know that, that w when that was put into action, it led in all kinds of directions, which I don't think you approve of. Um, but I suppose the, what I'm thinking about in, my, in the background here is that he was offering sort of structural solutions. He was saying that um, behind this inability of you to communicate with the lady in pennies is, is, not, is not just a personal thing. It's something to do with the, ins the institutional structure that she's caught in and you're caught in. And that institutional structure is predicated on profit making, on uh, the laws of money and so on. So that on that sort of analysis, um, it's quite true that if we were all more open to each other, we would sort of cut through that. But I guess the idea is that the cause, the deep cause on, on this analysis of the problem is not personal. It's impersonal, it's structural, it's economic, and so on. I mean, do you, how do you think about that sort of response? Uh, well, I think where Marx went wrong was to look for a specific malfunction in society. He thinks, he thinks that, um, if we could eliminate the private ownership of the means of production, which means the private ownership of large corporations, of factories and the like, then somehow things would uh, improve and we would not be so alienated. Uh, I think that the very idea of eliminating the institutions, the idea of eliminating uh, the profit motive that operates the institutions, both of these are pie in the sky, uh, we know what happens to people when they are not constrained by the, uh, by the uh, profit motive. Uh, they don't do a lot. Uh, I uh, had a, uh, a person uh, come visit us from my native Hungary, and, uh, and he said, uh, well, this was still in the time that, uh, that uh, under communist rule, he said, well, they don't pay us much, but we don't do much. Uh, and, and that was absolutely right. The production was at a low ebb. So the comfort, our comfort would be seriously uh, impacted if we went that way. But I think specifically it's problematic to look for a malfunction in society. I think it's better to try to understand what's going on in terms of the natural outcome of the very things uh, that make for our happiness, that make for our comfort. The very things that make for our comfort also make for our discomfort. And you cannot eliminate the discomfort without eliminating the comfort. And I don't want to do that. So the question becomes, how do you do it? And, and I don't see another way of doing it except this openness that I'm, I'm talking about. And, uh, and the elimination of ever larger units, productive units, uh, those large productive units really find it very difficult to honor the individual in the way in which the individual needs to be honored. Let me ask you then a, a slightly different question, because um, th this idea of openness I really like. I mean, I think it's, it's very powerful. Um, but I can understand it in two different sorts of ways. One is between two people, uh, being candid, being open, being honest, being sincere, uh, being thoughtful, and so on. But then I also think about, um, uh, for example, many of the, of the small things that we do 
are perfectly reasonable and make perfect sense on their own. I mean, like drinking this bottled water, um, which we've provided. I mean, this, this makes perfect sense. You've got your own little reservoir of water here, and you know we're all individuals. And, but actually, the, the institution of these water bottles is, is really not good. I mean, we should find a way around this. Um, and that's, but that's a nice uh, example, because it shows that the small things that we do individually make perfect sense. But if you add them up, they may be environmentally really disastrous. And so what, what's needed there, though, I'm, I'm just sort of asking whether you would agree with this, is not so much openness on an interpersonal basis, but imagination, that you can actually, and that, that we have conversations and discussions about the impact that our individual actions that seem perfectly reasonable, when aggregated, would have on, on the planet. And so we have openness, in a sense, to information, to, uh, to, to vision, to imagination, uh, as well as simply to, um, to each other. I don't think that imagination can be detached from this openness to each other. I, I don't see how that's possible, because the, the, the openness requires filling in how the other person feels, and that's purely the work of the imagination. Uh, the other person has to be viewed as having an internal life, as having feelings, having emotions, having cares, having values. All of this is only in my mind. So, uh, so I, I, I'm, I'm completely in agreement with you. Let's not forget about the imagination. It's crucial. So what, well, the, the last thing I would put to you is, is uh, again, it's a problem about openness. It's a, it, these are fascinating issues. Um, that if I'm going to be open to you, I have to be open to me, first of all. And an awful lot of people, uh, and it may just be generally true, actually don't know themselves particularly well. Um, so if you say, well, you know, be honest, you first of all have to know what, what, you, what you think yourself. You have to have some um, clarity about who you are and what you're feeling and so on. And I suppose that uh, you know, what people like Freud told us, and you don't, you don't have to be a Freudian to, to believe this. Good. No, I know. I know. <laughs> Good. <laughs> but I mean, but you don't, I mean, you really don't. In that sense, he, he, he was saying something that's common sense. M make it clear that there's an awful lot going on in our own minds that we're not immediately aware of. So, um, in a sense, the thing about openness it involves not just interpersonal relations, but also a capacity to, uh, to be oneself, to, to think, to reflect, uh, not to have been traumatized to the point at which you don't know who you are, and, and so on. I think it's important to distinguish um, two ways of knowing who you are. Uh, on the one hand, I find that most people have a very clear idea of who they are. Uh, we, uh, uh, we have this unfortunate uh, tendency when somebody asks, you know, who are you? That means what do you do, which means what job you hold. But if you study the actions of people, they, um, they say so much about their values. Uh, they say so much about what they deeply believe uh, that, that it's astounding. It takes a, takes a lot of watching. But what, and, and I think that sort of being who you are or learning to be who you are or successfully being who you are is fine, no problem. I just don't want uh, to spend a lot of time uh, opening up the depths of our egos. Uh, I, I find that that's not very helpful. Normally, normally I find, I mean, I've, I know people who have been going to psychiatrists or to psychoanalysts for 15, 20, 30 years to no understandable benefit. Uh, they're just very interested in themselves. That's not the kind of uh, uh, self-knowledge that, that I care for. I think, I think self-knowledge by all means, uh, but self-knowledge almost instinctive and emotional and unthinking and nevertheless very real. But that lady in pennies, how would you describe her? I mean, she, she wasn't connecting with herself in she some ways. She didn't want to connect. 
She okay. didn't want to connect. She, she was a low paying employee who was being hassled by a bald guy and all she wanted, she couldn't care a hoot in hell about pen pennies. She probably didn't care for her job. She probably didn't care for her, for her, for her uh, person in charge. Uh, she, she, she was there pretty much just to be there and be paid probably minimum wage. I think the detachment is from herself, from other people, from the company that pays her fare, uh, from the rest of the world. She just wanted none of it. I think that's tragic because in fact, the more people feel the way I feel, the less likely it is that she'll be able to retain her job and jobs are not plentiful. Did she refund your? No, uh, I still own a blanket yeah. with a hole in the middle. <laughs> But it's a, it, it was I, I, worth it for the story, don't oh, you think? I, it, it's, uh, it's, it's, it's a wonderful story. I used to get so frustrated when I told it. <laughs> now I don't get frustrated. I'm, one of these days, I'm going to stitch it up. <laughs> and that'll be the end of the, st the whole. <laughs> All right, I think it's time we um, ask for questions on that. I'd like to uh, introduce and thank um, my assistants from Vanderbilt. Uh, we have uh, Sam Chambers up here, who's got a microphone to hand you, and <laughs> Jessica Polish up there for the other side of the room. So if you, if you would like to speak, just put your hand up and you'll get a microphone thrust into your hand. Thank you. Uh, can you relate your theories to the current level of anger and frustration in the political body, in the body politic? It seems to be that there are a lot of people who are very alienated um, and how does that, and unhappy and frustrated, how does that relate to your theories? I, I'd like to tell you a story about that. Uh, one of my colleagues in graduate school went into politics and eventually didn't go far, eventually ended up in the White House uh, in a fairly menial job answering letters that were sent to the president. Not the current president, this was some years back. and. Uh, turns out, as I was talking to her, it turned out that uh, there were dozens of people in the basement of the White House doing this. 30 to 35,000 letters in those days, 30 to 35,000 letters per week. And th these poor people were made to answer every letter, every single letter. Most of the letters were answered in a very cursory way, but nevertheless, the letters were answered. Did the president sign the letters? No. Uh, how were they signed? Robo. There's a robo signature of the president. And uh, they, uh, it, that's what they did. Now, I asked her this question, and she had a devastating answer. I said, uh, does the president see any of these letters? And she said, he sees a statistical summary of which way sentiment goes. Does she actually see, does he actually see any of the letters? And she said, no, never. Now, if you can't write a letter to the president and have the sense that um, Somebody is going to read it who will do something about it other than just respond to you by saying, thank you, Mr. Jones, for your letter. Of course you get frustrated. You know, not that many years ago, uh, less than 100 years ago, well less than 100 years ago, on Wednesday afternoons, the President of the United States stood outside the White House and shook hands with people. Forced, I agree, uh, probably a pain in the butt. Uh, but he stood out there and he actually, whoever came up shook the person's hand. Now, that's a symbolic affirmation of the meaning of an individual, right? Symbolic affirmation. We don't have symbolic affirmations and we don't have real affirmations. Are, are we together on this? I mean, I, I think the sad part of it is that we, there's no way in which you can make a difference. Your vote one way or the other doesn't make any difference. Nobody wins with one, by one vote. Okay. Yeah. Uh, I just see the cause and effect issue to be somewhat different than the individuality issue. I mean, society is so complex now 
that if you asked a person, well, like the water bottle issue, if you would want to eat meat of animals that were treated that way, most people, many people would say, no, I don't think that's right. But there's so many layers between a person and those things, those objects, those animals, where we get electricity, all these things, that um, I don't think people can make those decisions. They either don't have enough information or they don't have enough energy to sort through the information or they don't have enough options even if they have the information and the energy. So the cause and effect at this stage in our society goes well beyond you as an individual, it seems to me. You know, it's possible to uh, uh, disseminate information, respectful information about why decisions are made the way they're made, right? Uh, we just had a meeting at Vanderbilt last night, a town hall meeting concerning this non-discrimination policy that the, uh, the university invented. And uh, uh, the, I mean, it doesn't matter which side you, you, you stand on. It had to, there had to be tremendous upheaval in the student body before there was anything like this. Now, now there were three people involved from the administration and not, not one of the three was a chancellor. So what do you do? You, you stand outside the White House and yell. <laughs> you stand outside the chancellor's home and yell. You know, it's hopeless. You know, it just doesn't happen. Now, does that mean that we would want to be involved in all these decisions? Heavens no. I don't think we're idiots. Uh, we don't have the time. We don't have the knowledge. But we do need people to explain why. We do need people to respect us enough to say, here is our reasoning, what do you think? Most people will gladly say, sounds reasonable to me, I wouldn't want it that way, but that's life. No, we know how to do that, we know how to say that. But, but when, when there is no input, there is plenty of resentment. And it's the resentment that we need to try to eliminate. And it's, I think it's, it's eliminated by, if not input, then at least output by the people who make the decisions so that we also have the sense that we somehow can appropriate those acts. That's the word I'm looking for. We need to be able to appropriate the acts that others take. And the way we do that is for others to say, here's why we're doing it. It seems to me that your structure suggests that within a societal context, the individual is looking for some sort of affirmation of um, what makes a person unique. Um, wouldn't it make much more sense to, instead of find discomfort from your own uh, seeming wor worthlessness, insignificance within society, to recognize your own individually, individuality isn't? in any way special and that you are just a cog within a machine in the sense that instead of restructuring society to recognize the individual as important, to restructure the individual to recognize that society is more important, um, I am under the, I don't know, I, recognizing your argument, it seems that this discomfort that we have would be the natural result of any individualistic society that uh, focuses on this sort of idea of Western individualism instead of being comforted by or accepting the fact that your own individuality is not nearly as important as the structures that society's created for our own comfort. You know, um, there is no society that's not a collection of individuals. I, I'm totally unaware of any society that's, that doesn't consist of individuals and, and their interrelations. So uh, what is it that we're gonna do in order to make these individuals understand, one, what society is doing with their help, and two, how they can experience it in a way that will make them partners. Ah, that's what we're looking for, partnership. 
we're all partners in reality, but, but somehow uh, some of us have the feeling that we're junior partners. And even that's all right, so long as the senior partners tell us what's going on. So um, uh, I, I don't want to give you the impression that, that I believe that, it, that individuals are um, insular entities. I know, onto themselves, and, uh, and they don't connect to people. We connect to people all the time. Um, we have incredible social bonds with people, or else we would not be able to operate in these large chains as, as we do. So, so what, we, uh, what, what we've got to do, I think, is to uh, forge the psychological bonds that would uh, be the counterpart of the social bonds that we already have. And these psychological bonds are ways of belonging with each other and seeing ourselves as individuals, but individuals among individuals. Yes, lady. Um, I'm fortunate enough to have grown up in the household of a sociologist. Uh, and my father said that one of the best ways to affect change was to work within the system. And I now have a PR firm, and I do have lots of opportunities to affect change. And I do find that working within the system works, and that you can be an individual and make change. And usually the projects that I've worked with have started with a couple of individuals who collected together people with the same feelings. And then they put together a coalition that acted on that. And we've, I've been involved in several projects where we've changed things, uh, getting more music and the arts in the schools, uh, changing the way di people with diabetes are treated, just lots of things. And so I, I'm, I was feeling pretty pessimistic about what I was hearing. And I think there are ways, if people are really committed to a cause, to affect change when they want to. I to go ahead. That's, I'm through. Okay, I totally agree with you that you've got got to walk with uh, work within the system. I, I agree with that. Uh, I'm not willing to give up my comforts, and that is provided by the system. Not willing to give up the comforts. I just want to eliminate the discomforts to the greatest possible extent, and the way to do that is to begin to talk to people and say, uh, look. Uh, uh, would you like to have more devoted employees? Here's what you do. Not, not necessarily pay them more. That's the, that's the amazing thing to me. Paying them more might just embitter them all the more. Because they'll, hmm, they'll have all kinds of ideas about how much money you're making if you're, if you're the boss. Uh, that's, that's not the way to go. The way to go is to treat them humanely. Treat them as, as human beings who have a say, even though they just happen to be the janitor. I wasn't necessarily saying that you have to be compliant with the system, but to say to use the system to work for you, get to a point of influence within the system that you can make the change and make the system work the, the way you'd like to see it work. And that is possible. I'm working on it. <laughs> it's very difficult for people in the academic world to be working on these things, because we, uh, we tend to be too cerebral for our own good. Um, but, but I think you can, if, if you work from the ground up and, uh, and talk to people in positions of, uh, of authority, um, some headway can be made, although it's extremely difficult to get people in positions of authority to listen to you. It occurs to me that one of the cost of comfort is sort of a weird combination of impotence and entitlement. And crazily enough, we kind of got this entitlement out of um, valuing individuals. Your time is valuable, so you shouldn't have to cook. Your time is valuable, so you don't need to cut wood. We have these thermostats that create things for you. So you have this sense of entitlement that your time, because your time is, is valuable and you are entitled to all this. And yet then you get up in the morning and you're impotent because everything is done for you. You don't, 
you don't uh, do anything to the coffee beans, it's all done for you. And so I think you're sort of desperate to have a sense that you make a difference. So when the lady doesn't even acknowledge the hole in your blanket, you've been impotent all day long. And perhaps what we need is some way to empower everyone to, so that we're over that sense of impotence, so that she can somehow have some kind of power and that you can feel that you have some power too. Because I think the cost of comfort is this weird impotence and entitlement. I think that's right. I think what you say is right. Um, um, I don't know if I need to say more. I, mean, I think what you say is right. I, I, th I think maybe, maybe this much more, uh, that um, I take very seriously the idea of the, of the whole human act with planning, execution, and enjoyment or pain of the results. Okay. When everything is done for you, when you just go to Kroger's and, and buy whatever you're gonna eat and, and warm it up, uh, somehow even that uh, contributes to the frustration of not actually completely doing something. Uh, I know a number of our friends uh, have got into uh, fancy cooking, and the reason they got into fancy cooking, I believe, is not just the flavors, flavors are important, but because it's a ritual, it's a complete human activity. You know, they plan on doing it, they gather the ingredients, they work hard to bring it about, and eventually they reap the rewards. I think okay. that's wonderful. Okay, we got just two more quick questions. Um, one there and one down here. I need to phrase this carefully, but I'm thinking about your blanket again. Um, what, uh, first I'll ask globally, what would have been an acceptable answer and where do you think that we as individuals or as a consumer have personal accountability to? If that had been a loaf of bread and you got home and it was stale and you wanted to return it and it said final sale, would you have felt as strongly about it as having final sale, which to me kind of implies open it up, make sure it's okay? Do you understand what I'm asking? You're a better buyer than I am. <laughs> I, I, I just pull it off the shelf and say, you know, if it's pennies, it's got to be no hole. But if I were somebody that came back, I had bought, maybe paid $80 for the blanket two weeks sooner, and I came back and saw seven seventy seven, and I said to the clerk, I want to return this. I want to buy it for seven. You know, there, there's, a, there's a point at which I'm sure she can just glaze over and go, this is, these are the rules. I don't know. You know, what you, you asked the, a, a very poignant question. What is it that, uh, uh, that would have been an adequate answer? Um, I'm so sorry this happened to you, sir. That would have been one kind of adequate answer. Uh, she could have pushed it off and saying, uh, may I take your telephone number and your address and I'll tell my boss and uh, you'll get a call from us. Now, at least something that says, hey, we acknowledge that something happened that wasn't right and you're an important customer. I'm not an important customer, but I like to hear that I am. <laughs> okay, I'm afraid the last question here. Uh, yes, I'd, I'd like to ask your opinion on the uh, potential of things getting better. Uh, starting with your J.C. Penney story, I read in the paper the other day that uh, because of their disastrous Christmas sales, they've had to change their whole business model and revamp everything to avoid bankruptcy. Maybe there was a lot of that going on with the uh, sales clerks. And uh, compare that to, uh, to uh, Nissan, which we used to hear the stories about work groups at Nissan getting together to contribute to the improvement of their products, knowing full well what goes on down the line and so forth. In other words, institutionally, Nissan address some of these concerns, pennies didn't, and they're both trying to make money for their shareholders. Now, given that profit incentive, do you think there are ways to, 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 to encourage organizations to be inclusive, to be responsive, to uh, honor the individual? I think there are ways of doing it. I mean, one way of doing it is to avoid buying from institutions that, uh, that don't do that. 
and, and, and advertise the fact that you're not going to go near the place because they just don't do what they ought to do. Uh, I, I think it's very difficult to get corporations turned around, extremely difficult. I'm, I'm completely with a lady, the sociologist lady, who says you've got to work within the system and try to see if you can make a difference. But you can get mighty frustrated trying to make a difference when nobody listens. And so you, you maybe you have to get the decibels up a little bit and shriek a little more. And, and, and maybe the sales go uh, down. And if the sales go down, they'll listen. Thank you very much, John. We've been listening. <laughs> and thank you. We will uh, meet again this time next month.